a royal priesthood. That's all I want to read. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Speak to each and every one of us, God. We turn this service over to you in Jesus' name. We all said amen and amen. Now do me a favor and, and turn now your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. You know, some of you um, know that, um, some of you know me know that, that usually I don't, I don't preach on women in the Bible too often. Usually I preach on a lot of different men in the Bible. But um, today I'm going, you know, we're going through the book of 1 Samuel. We're talking about royalty. We believe, I believe that you're called to be royalty. Tell the person next to you, you're royalty. Because how many know we are children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? And so we are royalty. So we got to start walking like it, talking like it, acting like it, thinking like it, right? Yeah. And so today I want to talk to you about a woman that, that's, that's in the Bible. We're going through uh, one of the kings that God used in the Bible. His name is David, a man after God's own heart. Why? Because I believe we need to be a people after God, after the heart of God. And um, we're, we've been going through all the, of, of 1 Samuel, and we're, we're now at chapter 25, and in, in 1 Samuel 25, verse 1, something kind of sad, I guess you could say, of, uh, it says, now Samuel died. So this was one of the prophets. This was a man of God right here. This was a prophet of God. He was, um, he was the last of the judges, the last of, of, the, of the judges slash prophets that, that, um, that reigned, you know, over Israel. Before there was an officially a king, this guy was a good guy. This guy was, you ever meet people that, man, you say, that's a good guy right there. You know what I'm talking about? This is one of those guys that you say, you would meet him and say, man, this is a good guy right here. Samuel was a good guy. And, 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 he, and he died. And the Bible says that all of Israel gathered for his funeral. Why? Because he was a man of honor. And I want to challenge you. And I want to challenge you to live honorably and die honorably. Live honorably and die honorably. Live honorably. Live an honorable life. Be a man of honor. Be a woman of honor. Live that way no matter what. He was an example that we can serve the Lord. You ever feel like, man, I don't think I could serve the Lord. I felt like that many times. But there's guys like him that, that let you know that, we could serve the Lord and, and, and be right with him. And this is that kind of guy. Anyway, so, th so, so the rest of the chapter goes on, and it goes right back to the other main character of Samuel, of the book of Samuel, and that is David. So then it goes on. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 25, uh, towards uh, verse 1, the ending of verse 1. It says this, Then David moved down to the wilderness, to, to mound. And verse 2 says, there was a wealthy man. Now this is, this is a, a couple I want to talk to you about. This is a couple that I want to talk to you. You ever meet someone and you wonder, how did he get her? Come on. You, I know we're in church. I know you're trying to be spiritual right now and be like, no. People act spiritual on Facebook too, right? They, they act so politically correct all the time, right? Well, this was one of those couples where you're going, what are you doing with him? Maybe you're the person that's getting, that, that people warn others about. Maybe that's what's happening right now. Maybe people ask whoever you're with, like, what are you doing with them? Amen? Well, <laughs> this is one of those situations where it's just like what the Bible calls unequally yoked. By the way, the, the Bible discourages us being with someone that's not at our level, you know? And, and, and spiritually speaking, how many know we want to be saved and on fire for God, right? And we should be with someone that is saved and on fire for God. That's how really ideally, that's how it should be, right? Now, sometimes we, we don't meet in the church, right? My wife and I didn't grow up in church. We met by a keg at a backyard party. You know what I'm saying? So we did not leave, meet at the altar, but thank God for the altar because that's where God changed us, saved us, showed us how to be a spouse, a parent, a man of God, for her a woman of God. And so it's possible, right? Well, but sometimes 
it's it's it, it just there's something there's un, there's not balance there or there's 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 you know someone that has character that's married to someone with with not good character this is one of those situations here and and you see here in verse 2 it says there was a wealthy man there was a wealthy man it says who owned property near the town of, of Carmel and, the, and then it says he had 3,000 sheep. It starts basically saying all the things that, that this guy had, right? And then in verse 3, it says, This man's name was Nabal, and his wife was Abigail. So today I want to talk to you about, in, you know, in the spirit of women's leadership retreat, I want to talk to you about a woman in the Bible named Abigail. This is a good woman of God, and we could all learn lessons from this woman, Abigail of being a godly person. How many want to be a godly person? She was a godly person. I don't know how she ended up with this guy who was not a godly man. It could have been that because back in those days, a lot of times the parents, you know, would betroth you. You know, they would make a deal so that you would be a baby and, and you're already promised to be married to this person. And often the person would be older and maybe it's a, a good financial move for the family. And, and, I, want, I, and I, want, I want to encourage you to learn how to, when you're going to date someone for the singles, right, learn how to get the blessings, right, from, from people who love you, who are close to God, who are spiritual. But those who give the blessings, we got to make sure that character needs to count. Don't just look at the outside. Don't just look at their bank account. Look at their inside. The inside matters of who you are with or who we're encouraging someone to be with, right? And, um, and, and with, with this guy had a lot of stuff. He had a lot of things. He was a rich man. And, and, and verse 3, it, it tells us his name, right? It, it, his name was Nabal. It tells us her name. Her name was Abigail. And the Bible says that she was intelligent and beautiful. So this guy came up on a smart and beautiful woman. How many know that sounds like a victory outreach woman of God right there, right? That sounds like a victory outreach woman of God. That sounds like a gang girl right there. She was beautiful and intelligent. In other words, she had wisdom, you know? She was sharp. She was smart, intelligent. But, but let me tell you about the husband. The Bible says, goes on in verse 3, it says, but Nabal, a, a descendant of Caleb, was crude. In other words, he was a harsh man. And he was mean, in other words, evil and, and, and mean in, in all his dealings. So here is this man who's known as a mean man, an evil man, who's with a woman who's known to be very intelligent and, and, and beautiful. In verse 4, the Bible says, when David heard that this guy, that, that man, Nabal, was, was shearing his sheep. Now, what they would do is basically he, he's, he's uh, cashing in on his money uh, that his sheep, all these sheep, they, they help him make money. And it was time to cash in on those sheep. So Nabal, that rich guy, was going to get even richer right now, right? So verse 5 says this. So when David heard about that he was going to do that, verse 5 says that he sent 10 of his young guys and to give that rich guy in a ball a message. He, and he told them, tell him this, tell him, peace and prosperity be, peace and prosperity to you, your family, and everything you own, he says. I am told that, that, that it is sheep shearing time. While your shepherd stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them. Nothing was ever stolen from them. Ask your own men, and they will tell you that this is true. So, so would you be kind to us, since we have come at a, at a time of celebration, please share any provisions you might have on hand with us and with your, and with your friend David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal in David's name, and they waited for the reply. So let's wait, wait, wait for a second. Pause for a second. So, so here is David. David has, David, remember, this guy is the guy who killed the most powerful enemy, Goliath. 
okay? This guy has a following of 600 warriors that he's training, okay? And this guy is, is, is his name is growing, his fame is growing, even, and, and, and so, so in those days, basically, if you were part of a military and you were in an area and, and because you're military, because you're there, you're armed and, and you provide kind of like a safe place for everyone who does business, it was, it was the ethical obligation for all those who had businesses there to, to kick you down, to give you money, kind of like for saying, man, you kept us safe because of your presence, we're good. Okay, now I, I guess I, so for those of you who didn't understand what I just said, it's kind of like going to the game room, hello somebody, and then you win, and then you tip people who work there. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's kind of like what it's like, or you go to Vegas, and people do that, right? They'll tip that person because they won. That's kind of like what it's like. That's exactly what the culture was like there, except, you know, the, if because he had so many sheep, and, his, and this rich man's sheep were among David's army, and they provided safety for them, there was an ethical obligation for him, being a rich man, to do what he can to provide for this army here. And so, so they, they send word. They kind of go and, and collect, if you will. And, and verse 10, this is the response from this mean man, right? Remember, he's a mean, evil man, not a good man. He says this, who is this fellow David? Everybody say, oh, oh, that's all bad right there. You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine a guy who's just like, hardcore, this guy runs the streets, this is the man, and he's got a big crew, and he's just asking you to do something, and that's your obligation actually to do culturally and ethically, and, 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 and so, and the guy's response is, who is he? Right? Who is he? Who is he? he like, kind of like saying, he's, he ain't nobody, right? Uh, minimizing who David was, and then he says, it says, the Bible says that Nabal sneered, sneered to the, to the young men, you know? And, and then it goes, who does this son of Jesse think he is? That almost sounds like he's going to cuss right there, right? He goes, there are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat and, and that I have slaughtered for, for my shears uh, to give it to a band of outlaws? who come from who knows where. So verse 12 says this, So David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said. This is what David said, verse 13. Get your swords. My God. Get your swords, he says. That was David's reply. And, and as he strapped on his own. You didn't know that strapping was in the Bible, right? <laughs> so, so David strapped his own. And then 400 men started off with David and 200 remained behind him to guard their equipment. How many know that's all bad for that guy in the ball, right? That, 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 this is all bad. So now you got two guys who are, all due respect to David, he's being prideful. Because some of you here are going, well, you know, you know, you know, he shouldn't just go tax someone for their stuff and just forcefully take it and, and, and then get angry and then go with swords to go now. You know, you know so, so and, and really, we're probably right in thinking that. So really what you have now is a, is a standoff now between two men with pride. You ever been there? You ever had pride? And you're talking to someone with pride also? You ever been in a standoff? Some of you are in a standoff right now, right? You're, you, you, it was in the car with your spouse on, on the way up here, right? Hello. Or with someone you live with. And, 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 and so you have a, a two prideful people. But thank God for humble people. Thank God for peacemakers. And let me tell you, God wants you and me to be peacemakers. 
God wants us to be like that. I've been talking to you also about having a pure heart, having pure hearts. Part of having a pure heart is not wanting to see people go at it. I know we live in a time where we want to see them YouTube fights. But you know, we got to be like, we got to be like pure and not want to see people go at it. We, we shouldn't be like taking sides and, and, and get a kick out of di division or, or, or instigate people or feed on to someone as they're angry with someone who possibly did offend them. And maybe they have a point and all that. But our job is to bring peace. I said our job is to bring peace. That's our job. And so we see here that, that um, in verse 14 it says, Meanwhile, thank God for people with wisdom. Listen to this. Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. So this guy was, so, so the Bible doesn't tell us everything that went down in that conversation, but apparently this guy was even screaming insults at David's men. Okay, so, and now she, this, this um, or he rather, this servant does the wise thing. And he goes to Abigail in verse 15, it says, these men have been very good to us. Talking about David and his men. He goes, these men have been very good to us. We never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. And remember, he's calling them outlaws and telling them off. He says, you need to know this. And he tells, him, tells her this. And you need to figure out what to do. For there, for there is going to be trouble in our master, uh, uh, for our master and his whole family. He's so ill-tempered that no one can even talk to him. You, ever, you know anyone like that? That no one could talk to you? No one could talk to them? And maybe, maybe we got that aura, maybe we, got, we throw out that, you know, out there, you know, where, where people don't feel they can talk to us. Some of us are parents, and our kids feel they can't talk to us. Some of us are, are married and our spouse feels they can't talk to us. You know, uh, and, and we need to be people that are approachable. That people should be able to address us and talk to us about things. Say, God, help me to be more approachable. We need to, we need to get help from God to be more approachable. And some of us, you know, some of us, you know, maybe we feel approachable, but our face doesn't look approachable. <laughs> My wife used to tell me that. She was like, work on your face. She'd be like, do you hate my family? No, I don't hate your family. The uh, how when we're there, you sit there like mad at the, at the gatherings. And you're I'm like, I'm not mad. I'm having a ball, right? I just look like this. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Even some of the guys, so they're all, uh, make something beautiful out of me, right? You know, when we sing that, some guys feel awkward singing that part, right? But how many know we're tore up? Well, some of us, you know, not all of us, but some of us are so tore up that we know what that song means. We're like, yeah, that's true. We need something made beautiful in us. How many need something done in them by God? Amen? And, and, and some of us got to work on our face. And I'm not talking about shaving and, you know, I'm not talking about that stuff, our looks. I'm talking about just looking joyful. We're saved. We're on fire for God. We're, we got set free. We've been delivered. Praise the Lord. So we got to have some joy in our life and, 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 and you know, and, and show that, right? Well, so as the story goes on, this guy tells this woman... Abigail, and she says, man, you know, your husband, she's, now mind you, this servant is talking about his boss and her husband, and he's saying, man, no one could even talk to him, and, and his ways are going to hurt us, they're going to get us killed, he, his ways have brought trouble to our house, because remember, there's an army coming, there's what some of your Bible says, disaster is coming to our household." And, and you know what? When I was reading that, that may unfortunately be a word 
for someone here that disaster is coming to your household? Is it, that's a terrible word, right? You don't want to hear a word like that, right? You want to hear like, like, like your royalty, your whole family's going to get saved. You're like, yes, I receive it. But you know what? When you come across passages, it's for a reason. So we are doing the study faithfully, going through the word of God. And apparently there's this household that disaster was going to strike and was on its way. But thank God for an intelligent woman. Thank God for a woman with wisdom. Thank God for someone with wisdom. Thank God for someone who thought quick. Thank God for someone who reacted spiritual. You know we got to learn to react spiritual. She didn't say, so okay, then get the guys, get your swords ready. We're in for a fight right now. No, she reacted in the spirit. You know that, that when we get hit, if, if you want to prevent disaster from bringing disaster to your house, we got to react in the spirit. I said, we got to react in the spirit. If you sense disaster is already in the, at the door of your house or it's already made its way in your living room or in your bedroom or in your kid's room, I want to encourage you, you react in the spirit. React in the spirit. This woman reacted with wisdom and wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible goes on. Verse 18, Abigail wasted no time. See, we can't procrastinate. Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, um, nearly a bushel of roasted green, a hundred clusters of raisin, and 200 fig cakes. How many know that food will calm a man down? You got to understand, David was hungry. You don't mess with a hungry man. So he, got, he heard that and he was hungry. You know what I mean? It's like, so, so, so she does something so wise and she, she sends food. She, and she, she sends food his way. And then the Bible goes on she, in verse 19 and, and said to her servant, go ahead and I will follow shortly. But she did not tell her husband what she was doing. I had a point there uh, that I said, Sometimes you can't tell your spouse. So there's some things you, you probably shouldn't tell your spouse. Did you hear that? There are some things you probably shouldn't tell your spouse. Now you got to use wisdom in, uh, from the Holy Spirit in regards to what that may mean in your situation. But in this situation, this was true. This was true. It was better he did not know. If he would have known, he would have ruined it. She was moving in wisdom. And in her wisdom, she was led not to tell them. You know, sometimes you shouldn't tell people certain things. You know, there are some, you know, you know sometimes we tell people and we stir them up. You, you, we tell them what you heard someone said about them. And we're being used to the devil. You understand what I'm saying? So we got to be careful with that. She was wise to keep it from him. Verse 20 says this. As she was riding her donkey into the mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming down towards, towards her. David, um, David just finishing this. Man, a, a lot of good it did us to help this fellow. He prote we protected his, his wilderness. We, we protected him in the wilderness, excuse me. And nothing he owned was lost or stolen. But, but he has repaid us with evil, repaid me with evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. David was angry. Mind you, in some of your versions of the Bible, it says, um, this man stole from David, something like that. It's like, you are David. So he was talking like about himself. But verse 26 says this. Now, now. My Lord, it's, this, this is, excuse me, actually not 26. It's, it's it, um, go to verse 23, right? Verse 23. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey, bowed low before him, and she fell at his feet and said, accept all blame. I ex excuse me. She says, I accept all blame in this matter. 
what a woman of character. You, you hear that? She says, she says, first of all, right, she bows down. She bows down. She gets off her donkey, starts bowing down. She already gave him this food or sent this food before. She falls, you know, she, on, on the floor there. She's, and then she says, I accept all blame in this matter, my Lord. How many know that a person of character takes ownership? That's, that's being a person of honor right there. It wasn't even on her that she, yeah, that she said, yeah, she said, you know, here are the guns, the guns or the swords pointing at somewhere else. She's like, point them at me. This is on me. How many know that's a person of honor right there, right? And that's, that's how we got to be, you know, a person of honor like, 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 like this woman here. And, and so, so she does that and, and um, the Bible says, you know, it goes on. It says, I accept all the blame, my Lord. She says, please listen to what I have to say. Verse 25, I know Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. Talk about her husband, by the way. Please don't pay any attention to him. I don't. That's what she, that, like most wives, hello, right? Please don't pay any attention to him. He is a fool. My God, she's going off on her husband, right? He is a fool just as his name suggests. Because his name means fool. She was married to a fool. I'm not going to ask you if you're married to a fool. I'm not going to do that. He is a fool, just as his name suggests. But I never even saw your young, the young men you sent. Now, my Lord, she says, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands. Now, mind you, she's already speaking that by faith. So she's like, since you're not going to kill them, you know what I mean? So, so he's like, he never even said he's not going to kill them, but, but she's, you know, she's so wise, you know, how she's talking. She says, let your enemies and those who try to harm you be a, as cursed as Nabal is. Talk about her husband. And, 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 and she says, and here is a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with, la with a lasting dynasty. She's, she's pretty much being used of the Lord, by the way, to prophesy here. For you are fighting the Lord's battles. And you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Now, I don't know if she's lying right there. I'm not sure. But I do know this, that, that she is, she is ministering to him you know when someone's raged up and they're hot tempered you got to minister to them you got to say you got to prophesy to them say you are a good man you are a good woman you are called to do great things you, you, you understand what i'm saying she this guy has his swords has a sword there with him, has his men with swords he says every one of this his, and his men are going to die by morning you understand what I'm saying? This guy is hungry. He's, 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 this guy's a killer. Remember, remember, this guy killed Goliath. So this is no guy to mess with. While he is a man after God's own heart and all that. But, but you, you, you see the, the picture here. And yet she's, she's talking so wise. There's some of you, you got to learn. We got to learn to counsel and minister. Because you could save people from doing something very dumb. May God anoint each and every one of you here in this place to minister, to counsel people in their time of need. Come on, if you receive that, if you want to receive an anointing to minister, to counsel, I want you to lift your hands and ask God to anoint you right now because there's sons of da and daughters and brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and sinners, people who are lost, friends, people you may know that may be contemplating suicide or, 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 or want to shoot somebody or hurt somebody or, or do something, you know, wrong. And God is going to use you to minister to them, to counsel them. And God's going to give you the words. And God's going to use you to stop them in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a big hand of praise. You've got to step out and let God use you. To step out and let the Lord use you. The Bible goes on. The Bible goes on, verse 29, even when, it, she, she's telling him this, even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, talking about Saul, the king, your, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. Remember, 
David knows about pouches. He had a pouch with stones, and, and she's saying she's using his type of lingua. But the lives of your enemies, she says, the lives of your enemy will disappear like, like stones shot, shot from, a, from a sling. See how she's talking? She says, when the Lord has done all he promised. Remember, she's talking under the anointing of God here. She says, and, 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 and he has made you the leader of Israel. Look at that. She says, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Don't let this be a blemish on your record. See, there's some of us, we want to do something that's going to blemish us. Don't do nothing that's going to blemish you. If it's going to blemish you, do not do it. And she's ministering to him saying, don't let, don't go do this. It's going to be on your record. This blemish will, will follow you. It will, how many thank God for the blood of Jesus? Because we come in with blemishes. But thank God for the power in the blood of Jesus that wipes those blemishes. He bore those blemishes on that cross. And we are wiped clean by our faith in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give the Lord another clap offering. He deserves it. Now, as I bring it to a close here, they were... David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord. Verse 32, verse 32. Uh, David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. In other words, man, God used you right now. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. Wow. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept me from hurting you, that if, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive by tomorrow morning. Then David accepted her presence and told her, return home in peace. I have heard what you said. We will not kill your husband. When Abigail arrived home, she found Nabal. And he was throwing a big party and was celebrating like if he was a king. And he's not. He was very drunk. Remember, he's a fool. I mean, no, we don't do those foolish things no more. He was very drunk, so she didn't tell him anything about her meeting with David until dawn the next day. See, he's still using wisdom. In the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him what had happened. And as a result, he had a stroke. That's how angry he got. And he laid paralyzed on his bed like a stone. Verse 20, 38 says, And about ten days later the Lord struck him and he died. When David heard of Nabal, that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise the Lord who has avenged the, ins the insult I received from Nabal and has kept me from doing it myself. Nabal has received the punishment for his sin. Then David sent messengers to Abigail to ask her to become his wife. And guess what happened? They got married. Thank you very much. God bless you. And guess what happened? She became royalty. She became royalty. She became royalty. A woman of character. She became royalty. Amen. Amen. How I many know oh, vengeance is the Lord? Give the Lord a big hand clap. Give Sister Tamika a big hand as she comes to close us off. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand of praise this morning. Amen. Are you excited? I know that the women, we came back on fire for God. I know some of us, we went, you know, struggling, hello, but we came back fired up. We came back saved, amen. <laughs> I felt like I got saved all over again, and, and I just thank God for this awesome ministry, amen, that God saved me in, amen, and I thank God for our founders. Man, our founders lead by exampleship. They are our examples, amen. And I want to thank Pastor Tony and Sister Veto, our spiritual mama and our spiritual dad for everything. Um, 
for saying yes, amen, to the call of God. And that was mentioned in one of the speakers, you know, your, the power in your yes, amen. And as I stand here, I see the power of their yes, amen, that God used them to reach us, amen. And I also want to thank my husband, amen, for holding it down. We have six kids. So my kids were probably walking around all happy with their hair on nappy, right? Because <laughs> he can't do it, their hair. <laughs> But um, I just thank God for him and, 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 um, and amen. So um, today, this morning, I want, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then I'm going to get into three points that God spoke to me about. Amen. Father, my God, we just come before you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this time, my God. We thank you for your word, God, that you've called us to be royalty, my God, and we receive it, my God. We want to be, God, vessels that you could use, God. God, I pray that you would remove me aside, my God, and, Lord, that you would speak through me, my God. God, anoint your word, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And my first point, I'm going to share three points that God really spoke to me about. Amen. And the first one is to be an asset, not a liability. Amen. And an asset is someone of value, a person of quality. Amen. And a liability is a, because I thought a liability, I was like, oh, the liability forms, you know, the forms that go home on a field trip. So I was like, what is that? <laughs> but I had to look it up. And a liability is a person or thing whose presence or behavior is likely to cause embarrassment or put one at a disadvantage. And I thought that was so heavy. When, she, when Sister Georgina said that, I was like, wow, wow, the, the heaviness of being a liability, amen? And, and you know, when we, are, when, when we struggle with being a liability, we don't just, we don't just um, put ourselves in a disadvantage but we put people around us in a disadvantage amen it's not just us that we affect but it's people around us amen and she um she challenges us to not be in the flesh amen to not be flesh monsters amen turn to your neighbor and say don't be a flesh monster don't be a flesh monster and um and, you know, a flesh monster is someone that's, you know, in the flesh with someone who's, who's a complainer. That's an example of one, a negative, negative uh, gossiping, someone that's not gi a giver, amen. And Ephesians, I'm going to read in Ephesians um, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 it says imitate God therefore in everything you do because you are his children live a life filled with love following the example of Christ he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us a pleasing aroma to God let there be no sexual immorality impurity or greed among you such sins have no place among God's people At Absent, absent stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. They, these are not for you. Amen? Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and, and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater uh, worshiping the things of this world. It says, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on those who disobey him. Don't participate in these things. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and what is true. Carefully determine the, what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about these things that ungodly people do in secret. Amen. And I wanted to share that because, you know what, when we live in the flesh, those, those are things that we do. You know, those are ways that we conduct ourselves when we allow our flesh to dictate our walk with God. Amen. And when we don't allow the spirit of God in our hearts, you know, when we're not in prayer, when we're not reading our word, we become a liability, amen, instead of an asset, we become a liability. 
And we don't want to do that, amen? We want to become an asset. We want to become a giver. We want to become a servant. We want to become an, an encourager, amen? Because we're called to be warriors. Sister Georgina says that we have warrior DNA in us, amen? And I remember we went on that seri series of warrior DNA. And, and it's not just words that are spoken behind the pulpit. It's, it's real, amen? We don't just say things just to say it. We're called to do something great great for God and it's going to take warriors amen to arise amen the second point that God spoke to me about is do more for God amen do more for God and victory outreach we are we aren't just called to just be saved amen we're not called just to be here and, and attend church services but we're called to reach people we're called to disciple people we're called to invest in people and transmit this vision in people now, amen? And we need to challenge ourselves to do so. Sister Raylene said that yesterday's victories can't be what we settle for for today. And I know that for me, that spoke volumes to me. You know, I've been saved 13 years, and sometimes you could get caught up in feeling like, oh, well, I did a Bible study before. Or I did the gang ministry before. But no, those victories don't hold no weight today, amen? We need new victories daily, amen? We need to know what are we doing today? What are we doing to further the gospel? What are we doing to build, to build a church, um, to build, amen, for our children to build for this generation amen sister Eileen was saying how the drug fentanyl is now being called the third wave and when she said that you just felt in that sanctuary it just got quiet you know it just you felt everyone just feeling grieved that that drug is being no is being called the third wave that's our name we're the third wave amen and that's how ugly the devil is the devil isn't playing no games and we shouldn't be playing no games either amen we got to take our place amen and we got to arise we got to arise and answer the call upon us amen and we do it because God saved us. You know, like Pastor was saying, he delivered us. Some of us are restored. Some of us aren't hooked on drugs no more or, or drinking our lives away. Some of us are here, you know, filled with joy. And it's our responsibility to not just keep it to ourselves, but to go and preach the gospel, to go tell our family members, to go tell our, our school people there in the high schools, in the new gen, in the junior highs, that, that we have that responsibility responsibility to preach to them amen to be that minister like abigail was amen in ephesians 5 it goes on to say in 13 but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them for the light makes everything visible this is why it said awake O sleeper rise from the dead and i'm here to say awake hawaii rise from the dead and christ will give you light so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise, amen? Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And we got to make the most of every opportunity. Every opportunity we have to tell someone, you know what, Jesus loves you. Every opportunity that we have to pray for someone, we got to make most of it. Because we're living in the last days, like Nadine was saying, that God, he's on his way back. And we want to take as many people with us to heaven, amen? We need to do more for God. We can't get caught up. We can't back down. I know for me, I struggled with insecurities. You know, always thinking negative about myself. But God, he told me, you know what? You need to put all that aside. And I've called you not to sit here and play no games. I've called you not to sit here and be in no pity party. But I've called you to preach the gospel, amen? And some of us, we need to get out of that pity party. We need to get out of that problem or that circumstance. Isn't God bigger than your circumstance? Isn't God greater? Isn't he your healer? Isn't he your provider? Amen. We need to do more for God. Amen. Thirdly, be desperate for God. And, and Sister Julie opened up um, this retreat with, with being desperate for God. 
And she used the scripture, Luke 11, 9 through 10, that, that we must continue to knock. Amen? That we must continue to knock. And when I saw her go up there and the desperation she had, man, like a woman of her caliber, you know, our founders, they're desperate for God, you know. They still go and preach the gospel. They still take time to pray for people. And we got to do the same, amen. When you're desperate for God, your posture changes, amen? When we begin to be desperate for God, our posture begins to change, amen? And there's something about, you know, uh, the posture of someone that's desperate for God. There's a difference. When your posture is there and you're desperate for God, there's something about that that catches God's attention, amen? Like we hear it in the, in the story of the woman with the issue of blood. How she was so desperate to touch the hem of Jesus' garment that she didn't let nothing stop her. I could imagine, you know, her hearing about Jesus. She, she spent so many money, went to different doctors for 12 years. She was bleeding. And she heard about a man named Jesus. And she knew if I could touch a hem of his garment that I would be healed. And, you know, there was all these people surrounding surrounding him there was all these people men surrounding him and you know what she pressed through the crowd so that she could get her breakthrough and I'm here to let you know that we got to be so desperate that we push through the crowd we push through the circumstance we push through the hindrance we push through the doubt the insecurities that we push through and we touch the hem of God's garment because we're so desperate for him and when we do so we will receive a blessing. We will receive our healing. We will receive these islands. We will receive Asia. We will receive the South Pacific. Amen. Are there any desperate people in this place? Amen. <laughs> Sister Zanel, Pastor Sunny Sr.'s granddaughter, explained how one time she overheard um, Pastor Sunny praying. And Pastor Sunny Sr. is our founder. And, and she said that, you know, she always admired the man that her grandfather is, you know, and that how he, you know, just sacrifices. He gives his life. He, lead, he leads people to Jesus. But she said that in this moment that she was hearing him pray before God, that she said that it was his posture before him that impacted her. It was his posture before the Lord that reminded her, man, this is why I love following this man of God. And, I'm, and it was his posture that reminded her that this is worth following, amen. That he, his life is worth following first because of his posture, she said, amen. And I'm here to ask, what is our posture like this morning? Is our posture worth following? Our children, the gang, the people under us, the people around us, do they see our posture before the Lord? Is it desperate for God? Are we grateful? Are we thankful for what God is doing? Amen? Because God, he cares more about our posture than all of our works. And that was key for me because I know for me, I, I love doing ministry i love you know i love putting my hands to the plow but god reminded me tamika it's your posture before me it's it's your desperation that i want to see amen and our posture before god it, it leads us to do more amen when we're talking about doing more when we're talking about being willing when we're using the word sacrifice loyalty commitment it all begins from our posture amen our posture before God amen and that's what's going to make the impact that's what's going to preach you know to our to the people amen to our families is our posture before God and we need to allow our posture to be desperate for him and right now as the keyboard player makes his way and as we stand, and in closing, I just want to challenge us. You know, I felt so challenged. I felt so broken. I know that we ran to every altar call. It was just, we, there was just an army of women, leaders, that were desperate for God. That we went not just coming with our requests, not just coming with, Lord, I need this or I need this. But we came in a posture of, God, we need your presence, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. 
And another, another thing they mentioned was having a repentful heart. Having a repentful heart. And sometimes they reminded us, we know that there's leaders in here. But we, so, but we still got to repent. Our position doesn't change that we need repentance daily. Amen. It doesn't matter how long we've been saved. It doesn't matter how, how many things we could do. We need, to be, we need to come repentful before the Lord. And this morning, I want to challenge us to be an asset. An asset to this vision. An asset to God. Because God wants to use each and every one of us. He wants to use our lives. He wants to use our families. He wants to use our spouses. He wants to use your story. I want to challenge us to do more for God. To do more for God. To preach more for God. To pray more for God. To pray more for our children. To pray more for this generation. To position our lives in desperation before the Lord. And this morning as the worship team sings a song, I'm going to invite you to these altars.